My name's Hugh Evans, from a company called Arnia. I've recently come back from Happy Mondia 2015 in South Korea. We gave three verbal presentations. One electronic beehive monitoring for beekeepers, which I'm going to go through now. Another one for a similar talk on how electronic monitoring benefits scientists. And a final one about our citizen science project, Build the Buzz, the value of big data. So it made sense to uh, maybe put them on YouTube, give anybody who didn't get the opportunity to see them in uh, Korea to maybe look at them from the comfort of their computer. So my name's Hugh Evans. I've been a beekeeper for over 15 years now. I've always enjoyed beekeeping. As for me, it's always been the perfect mix between a science and a craft. Anya has currently got four employees. There's me and Sandra at the top. Uh, George and Pete can be seen at the bottom there. As you notice, we're all beekeepers. Apparently, Mr. Dyson uh, uses one of his own vacuum cleaners every morning in his house. He thinks it's important that he understands what product he is making, how it works, why it's good, why it isn't good, its benefits, its drawbacks. And in a similar way, it's important that all of our members of staff understand what we do and why. We were established in 2009. We've got about 40 colonies in the UK and Italy, since sort of the come and go, you know. We've had a commercial product for over five years now, hundreds, we've got hundreds of hives in about 90 different countries, although I think that's gone up to 21 now. I think we recently sold a, a system to Jamaica. So yes, uh, original concept. We, I remember doing some swarm inspections, all UK beekeepers are trained that uh, every spring they should look for swarm cells. This involves, you know, removing every brood frame one by one, shaking the bees to check there's no swarm cells hiding in the corners of the frames. I mean, on this occasion, pretty much every time I do it, to be honest, I really, it didn't feel right what I was doing. The bees certainly didn't want to be disturbed and I definitely didn't want to be disturbing them. They were stinging me through my suit. I put the hive back together. I came back to the house and said, Sam, you know, I love beekeeping, but... Uh, what, what just happened there wasn't really for me. It's not something I'd really relish to ever do again. Surely in this day and age, if a surgeon can replace the valve in your heart via a vein in your leg, there must be some way of finding out what's going on in a beehive without actually having to take it to bits. So we came up with this concept of a little black box we could fit on the side of our beehive and it would send you a text message when there was a, a, a problem with the hive. And there we had it. Uh, about a year and a half later, we had actually produced a little black box that does actually come on the side of your hive and send you text messages when there's an issue with your bees. Uh, we started off uh, looking at swarm prediction only, but uh, noticed far more other thing, uh, useful things, uh, uh, not more useful, but other useful things that we could uh, also infeam and inform the beekeeper about. Here we have our hive scales. Weight of the hive is also a very interesting parameter. Uh, what you notice here, we see two, two styles of scale here, one's for the Langstrath, the more oblong one's for the Langstrath, the one on the right there is for your National Hive or your Dedant Hive, that fits on that one, we seem to have a shape that caters for virtually all hives. They're fairly cool, the hive scales, they're made from laser cut aluminium plates, they're very robust. Um, they, uh, the, the, the main feature of course is, is that donut design, if you have a ventilated floor hive, uh, the ventilated floor, a ventilated floor hive or a Varroa screen hive, either way, uh, you know, the idea is that the, the bees can drop debris out the bottom of their hive and it falls onto the ground out of harm's way. Uh, or if they're ventilating the hive, it allows airflow. And obviously, if you have a hive with this feature, uh, there is little point in then closing up that ventilation using a traditional platform beehive scale. They come in various colours, as I say, very groovy. There's a kind of, you know, a khaki one or a black one for the for the, uh, the beekeeper, the ones that are a bit less noticed. I know, uh, particularly on the continent, they like bright coloured ones to help distinguish between which hive is which. But uh, yeah, the scales are cool. Here you have the monitor gateway, basically the job of the gateway. It goes round and periodically collects data from the various models and uh, monitors and scales. It means that the monitors and scales only need a very low power uh, radio module sort of keeps any harmful uh, GSM waves, if, if indeed they are harmful, away from the, the, the bees. Uh, the gateway collects that data and sends it back to the user interface. Here we see a gateway with a weather pack fitted. This is what we call a self-emptying rain gauge. There's a clever little seesaw inside that fills it with water and when it gets full it clicks over, at which point the other side starts filling up with water, at which point it clicks back. And, 
and so on. There's a little magnet and reed switch arrangement that counts the clicks, and from that we can work out how much it's raining without having to go and empty it all the time. We also see a, a, a temperature sensor for sort of uh, the uh, air temperatures inside the in, inside the apri. Uh, this is the new gateway at which you can uh, attach a solar panel, uh, help save on battery life. All our all our units run on batteries that you can buy from a supermarket. The older monitors, their batteries only last about three months. It's a bit frustrating. That seemed a long time. That seemed like quite good battery life for little batteries about five years ago. But nowadays, we've moved to bigger batteries, so you can get hope. Then I think your gateway batteries last about seven months. But obviously, with a solar panel, they can they can go on and on and on. There's other advantages with the new gateway. It has uh, like a, a five-band GSM modem, so it work anywhere in the world. It also has satellite communication, so it can actually work anywhere there isn't mobile phone signal. Uh, it's got more memory. It's uh, faster. It's better on power. All sorts of other little features. This is our new microphone, and this is an important slide because really what. Uh, differentiates our system from other systems on the market is the use of acoustics. Uh, as I say, our manufacturers, we're lucky enough to have manufacturers who are experts in acoustics, uh, so we can use a lot of their technology. Here we have a little microphone, it's kind of isolated from the mounting bracket um, by a foam pad, which stops sort of vibrations getting through to the microphone. We've got all, all sorts of Gore-Tex glands and things to keep it dry. It really is quite an advanced microphone, it's noise cancelling and all sorts of things. Uh, but basically what sets our system apart from other monitoring systems is our use of acoustics, as we'll see later in the, uh, in the presentation. We also have electronic inspection logs. A lot of our customers may be scratching our head, thinking, what are these? These are due to be released in the next couple of weeks. Basically, you know, you can keep an eye on, uh, you know, it, it all fits on one, one page of, the, of an iPad or iPhone just by clicking these back and forward arrows. You can go back through previous inspections and... Uh, add new inspections. You can sort of flip the thing to the side here to make it much easier to add inspections. If you do this on an iPad, it ends up really quite big. Here we see it on a, on an iPad Air and an iPhone 6, I think. 6S possibly. I mean, it works on, on any tablet. Uh, uh, you, we can see how many stores. You keep an idea of how many stores you've got. Uh, you keep an idea of how much brood you've got and the type of brood you've got. Uh, the queen, with this drop down, you can actually select which number she is. If, if that's the way, you can keep an eye on your queen cells when they're appearing. Uh, and also the, uh, the the mood of the bees, not just the mood of the bees at the time. I mean, we use these little slyly faces. And I know that Sandra's record logs that this is replacing for us. Uh, we, we use a number from one to five to, to indicate how... how, how uh, how uh, defensive or angry the bees are feeling. I never remember which one's which, whether one is or five is the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the moody one. Um, but we, we also note the, the, the mood the bees ended up during the inspection, i.e. Uh, uh, you know, how, short, short pain, and how short their patience is. I, I find this quite interesting. Also for Roa, when you put it on, you know, there's an alert for various things. You, you click the alert button, it takes you to our alerts menu and it allows to tell you when uh, if you put feed on, you know, you'll get you to automatically alert you when it's time to change that. Also, in the queen, if there's no queen, you can send you alert when the queen has, you know, it does arrive or if the queen disappears. And, uh, you know, with your Varroa control, you can sort of get it to send you alert when it's time to, to change your Varroa. Obviously, the config of the hive, the weather conditions. Health's interesting. Keep an idea that obviously notes. But with the health, you know, you can say what things are, particularly maybe for more for, for uh, beginner beekeepers. A little information tab here. So if you think you've got chalk brew, but you're not entirely sure, you can see funny little sort of pellety things on your on your uh, crown board but you, I mean on your uh, landing board but you're not entirely sure if it's chalk brood you press on the little information it takes you off to a, a sort of one pager which will tell you if uh, if that uh, you know show you pictures of what chalk brood actually is user interface most people watching this may already be familiar with our user interface there's other YouTube videos that I um, dedicated to this here we have our high view, here's our graph view. If you click any of these sensors, it takes you to a graph page so you can see the sense, the, the, the data historically over time, alerts and things. Basically allows you to access information from your hive from any internet enabled device. So when you log into our user interface, the first thing you see is the high view. Each one of these four 
Hive icons represents a monitored hive. Each of the little center icons here is, is what we're measuring, monitoring on that hive. So here we have brood temperature, humidity. That's actually the temperature of the monitor, the acoustics. These two hives also have hive scales, displaying their instantaneous weight. The crowd of bees above each hive shows the activity of that hive, how busy the hive is. These two, obviously, are the more busy. That one's slightly less busy. This is the quietest. But in the, in the same way that when you walk into the apron, the kind of first thing you notice is who's busy and who isn't. In the same way, when you log on to our user interface, you get the same um, uh, impression and, and feel for your apiary without having to go all the way there to see with your own eyes. Here we have sort of today's weather temperature, today's weather conditions and what they have been over the past week. And then there's various things like signal strength, battery strength of the various monitors and gateways. This takes you off to your settings. You have download data if you want to download your data. But this gives you the, the, the basic idea of the high view. If we then click on a weight icon, it will take us to our graph view. Here we see the weight from a hive graphed over a year. So that's from August 2014 to August 2015. Obviously, here we see the nectar flow. Here we see the hive going into the, the winter last year. Uh, we see it sort of dropping. We take the supers off. We can see it dropping. Uh, then we see a pickup. Now, this for us was ivy. We get this sort of late nectar flow of ivy, which kind of sets them up for their winter food. In fact, you can actually see that the ivy almost took them all the way through the winter, that little last uh, uh, um, burst of ivy. Um, then from this point on, of course, they do nothing but they sort of form a cluster and do nothing but consume food. And you can see that, of course, by the the the, the, the gentle downward gradient of the line. And this this is... This can be seen as uh, uh, the uh, metabolism of the, the colony, if you like, how, how much they're sort of going through their food. Uh, we don't, we're lucky enough not to have to feed our bees. So we never feed our bees any time of the year. But if you were adding feed through the winter, you'd see, you know, a sudden rise in weight and then it disappears, sudden rise in weight, and then you see it disappear. But the gradient of this line depends on a few factors. It depends how strong your colony is. It also depends how cold it is and how much sort of food they need to keep themselves warm. But we can see the, uh, you know, the, the, the colony uh, go down in weight until April, at which point things start picking up. Uh, things pick up slowly and then of course the beginning of May, bang, the nectar starts flowing and in a very short time, I mean, you know, we all, all think of our bees collecting, uh, you know, nectar, uh, we, I guess we imagine it's a bit more gradual through the year, but if you look at it over a year's period, it's only a very short time the bees uh, are collecting all that nectar, I find that quite interesting. So if we actually want to get a closer look at this sort of nectar flow, we can actually use this bottom axis here to zoom in on that part of the graph by dragging these sliders and hopefully we'll see that in the next slide so there we go here we are zoomed in on the nectar flow you know we can see the uh, uh, the super going on here we can see the supers coming off um uh, we, we we could actually zoom in on this steep part of the curve even further by using the same technique using the sliders so here I've gone right on the on the on the uh, the steepest part of the nectar flow, and here we can see the the nectar coming in day by day. Uh, we see little disruptions here. I've added a comment. You can add a comment to any of our graphs, actually saying that we uh, we performed an inspection there and added a super at the end of the inspection. I think what's interesting is this area here where it kind of seems to flatten off, you know, and this is where we can start playing with the system. We think, well, what, what happened there? Because it does actually pick up afterwards, you know. Uh, so, so, so what sort of led to this sort of demise in, in, in nectar flow, you know. Uh, so we can think, well, you know, what, what was happening with the weather? And we can actually overlay the, the air temperature just by clicking on uh, this temperature in the sun here. So uh, uh, adding the air temperature, we can see, sure enough, there is indeed... Something funny going on. We basically have cold days during that time. We can see, you know, as the temperature, we haven't got much nectar flow coming in. We see as it gets warmer and warmer and warmer as we're sort of beginning May. This is in Italy, of course, so you're going up to 30 degrees. Uh, here's the day-night, day-night variation of the temperature. But we can see, yeah, as we've had a new, nice few hot days, you can see the temperature, you know, building up. Night, uh, as the temperature builds up, the nectar really begins to flow. And then we have these horrible cold days, at which point the nectar stops flowing as much or certainly the bees stop collecting it so you kind of think well, why is that then is that because the nectar doesn't flow at those low temperatures i mean it's is it too too cold for them to actually fly i mean we're less than 10 degrees here but i mean I, I don't know is 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 it only because of the temperature well we can maybe have a look at rainfall as well see if that answers any more uh any questions so including the rainfall line then obviously everything becomes apparent you know here we have a fairly flat rainfall a little tiny bit over here but then it's fairly flat then obviously we have quite a lot of rainfall uh on this day 
And then the day after that, it's obviously quite cloudy and murky and horrible, very low temperature. No surprises that the bees aren't collecting a huge amount of honey there. And then we get a little bit more rain on day three, and then the rain stops. Uh, and then we get a nice hot day. But you notice that the, that the honey doesn't start piling in on the first hot day afterwards. And I think that's probably a, a biological thing. I mean, what you notice is the bees are certainly flying there. But the trees themselves, after a heavy rainfall or, or, or an area of cold snap, you know, they, they, they still stop producing nectar. So all the bees are more than happy to go and get it. In fact, they've got really quite a hot day. Um, there's not really a lot there for them to collect. It takes a day or two for the tree to recover and start producing nectar again, which is why it's not until this day. Mind, once it starts, once it starts uh, collecting, uh, once it starts supplying nectar, it looks like the bees are very keen to get it. We see a big jump of uh, honey on that day, and even the day after is very, uh, very good. So yeah, this this um, dip in in nectar flow in in honey production, should I say, is is quite easily explained, uh, taking the uh, meteorological. Uh, weather data should I say uh, into account uh, weather data often explains a lot of what's going on with with your other sense readings if they begin to look a bit weird we can actually go back to the year before and look at the the the, the, heck, the nectar flow from that same hive the year before back in 2014 so looking over the same period again you can see a nice um, nectar flow you can see it coming in nice and strongly you can see here where we've added the supers uh, we can actually add a, a line for comparison. I mean, that's from this hive. I think we can add the the nectar coming in from the hive next door to that by simply clicking on that. And here we see the hive next door. If anybody's seen any of the other YouTube videos, you'll probably see I've already covered this in that. But here we have this small anomaly of a sudden drop in weight. I think it's about three and a half kilos. There's only two reasons, in my experience, that happens. Um, and that is uh, if the colony swarm were being robbed. And this was a swarm. Of course, and you can see this colony started off stronger than this little colony we were just looking at before. And obviously they didn't really collect as much as this one, being swart stronger. But then they swarmed, which kind of made them a bit weaker. And so obviously at that point in time, the, uh, the first hive we're looking at begins to catch them up. And by, you know, towards the end of May, they, they, they now become equal. The, strong, the weak colony uh, meets, the, meets up with the, the, um, what's left of the swarm colony. And they end up the same. So as well as being able to log in and monitor your hives remotely. You can also set up the system to send you alerts. Uh, SMS, we don't use those so much anymore. It's more email alerts. Or somebody said at a recent presentation I was giving, do you call that a B-mail? We tend not to. Uh, we just stick with the old-fashioned word uh, email. Uh, the first alert, obviously, or possibly the most important to a lot of people, is the theft alert. Uh, I mean, the, the value of a beehive full of bees these days is, is probably approaching £400. I mean, you can buy a, 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 a pretty good uh, laptop from PC World for £400, and who would leave one of those in their allotment unattended? Never mind two setting, sitting next to each other. So we have a theft alert, which sends the, the, the beekeeper a notification if his hive's being moved. Um... Not only theft, we can also tell if we can distinguish between it being moved or it actually falling over. I mean, uh, that happens a lot with wildlife in the uh, in America. It's often due to uh, brown bears in the UK. It's often teenagers on the way home from the from the pub. Uh, my point is, if a hive falls over, that doesn't usually it's 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 not the impact that kills the colony. It's the resulting exposure of the hive sort of lying or broken up on the ground. Uh, for often up to a week before the, D, the beekeeper turns up to discover it. So I know that a lot of our customers are comforted on windy nights with their mobile phone by their bed, knowing that it'll uh, uh, beep at them if their hive blows over in the wind. Um, we also have an alert when to add, remove supers. I mean, this is a big one for the for the commercial beekeepers. I, I know as a beekeeper myself, when I go to check my honey supers and I'm thinking, ooh, how they're doing, and as I take the crown board off, you know, as I break the crown board, it's a bit harder to break off than I was expecting. And I see all that white brood comb between the crown board and the top of the honey frames. And I think, oh, drat, they're full to the brim. And, you know, as, a, as, a, uh, uh, as, as an, uh, an amateur beekeeper, if you like, I mean, my then concern is now they've started filling up their brood comb with honey and the queen's got nowhere to lay. I go, oh, you know, but I mean, I think to a commercial beekeeper, he's probably thinking more drat. You know, if I'd been here uh, five days earlier, I could have put on another super and I'd probably have another half super of honey. Now, if he then looks down a line of 100 hives, I'm sure that thought becomes more and more depressing. So, so the ability to when to add honey and uh, when to take off supers, particularly if you're, if you're looking for a, 
a, a pure crop of honey. You know, if you've got a specific nectar flow you're trying to catch, it is very handy to know, uh, you know, at the end of that flow, um, you, you, we can do that with sort of the change in weight. And uh, that's, that, that, that is another interesting alert to have. When the colony is queenless, we can uh, alert beekeepers of that. Uh, a very useful alert, uh, particularly if you're... Um, <laughs> I don't know if, if I'm the only one that I don't know if I'm a lazy beekeeper, but often when I'm looking through my honey supers, I might have three boxes on. I look at the first one, I know it's pretty full. I lift it off. I get through the second one, which is three quarters full. I lift it off and I just lift up the lugs of the third one. I don't have to take it all the way off, but just by lifting one lug, I get a good idea how much honey's in it. The last thing I want to do at this point is then break that box off pull the queen excluder off and start going through every frame of the hive you know I, I, I just to check just to check that i've got a lane queen it's not what i want to do and if i knew that if i know that if i've got a monitor on the hive i know the uh, the colony's queenless i'm more than happy to leave them until the next inspection or so i don't feel i have to do it every time i'm checking to see how much how much honey i've got um also, if you know when your colony is queenless, you know when the queen writes, you know when, you, you know when the queen starts laying. And I, I find this useful with, with virgin queens. When I introduce a virgin into a hive, theoretically we're all taught we're not meant to bother that hive for the next three weeks or so. You know, the queen's quite flighty. She hasn't mated yet. Best to leave her alone. And sure enough, you know, you have that not nervous wait for three weeks, but, you know, there's a certain amount of anticipation when you first open that hive just to check that she has mated and she has started laying, you know, because if not, you'll have to sort of requeen. Uh, but to get a research, uh, alert to say yes, your queen started laying. I mean, this is this is great. I, I, I find this very useful. Um, at which point you can go straight in the hive if you like. When your bees have swarmed, to know they've swarmed that day, that is an interesting alert to get. Same if your bees are being robbed by other bees. Uh, it's an interesting alert to get as soon as you can. You can then restrict their entrance and often save the colony. If they have been ventilating during the winter, it becomes too too humid. We can send an alert out for that. Uh, feed management, of course. You put on your feed. I don't know if I'm the only one that... Um, you know, the, the limited experience I have of feeding, particularly in the UK, uh, you know, I, I, I turn up to change the, the feed on a, a Sunday morning, I, only to find they've still got half a bag of this candy left, and I think to myself, oh my goodness, that was a bit of a wasted trip. Or, or sometimes turn up to find a completely empty bag with kind of bees walking around inside it, you know, a few lone bees walking around inside an empty bag, thinking, drat, I wish I'd been here, you know, for, for five days before. So, and obviously from a, a commercial beekeeper's perspective, that, that, that's a huge, huge aid to their logistics. Also system alerts, you know, time to change batteries, you know, signal strengths and things, and that sort of thing. Possibly the most interesting alert uh, is that the bees have collected a lot of honey that day. I like that alert. And, and you know, to say your bees have had one of their mega days where they've half filled the super. And the reason I think it's interesting is because it actually shows that this electronic monitoring is changing the way we keep bees. You do not usually have uh, that that level of uh, uh, you know um, that 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 level with, with with your hive. You don't you don't know that um, what they're doing to that degree. Uh, it, 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 what I mean by that is, you know, we know they've they they collect a lot of honey in a week when you go and inspect them, but you don't know they've done it that 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 afternoon. I mean, why I think that it's an interesting alert is that there is no, although it's probably my, the favourite alert I like to get. There is no managerial consequence. I don't then have to go and do something. It's purely uh, for information only, if you like. And uh, not only is it a nice alert to get the next day, you're kind of left uh, um, uh, the the. You know, that you get one one day, and then the next day, wondering is is the same thing going to happen? If you if if, you, if you're too nervous to wait for the alert, you can actually log in and see how the the wait's going up that day. I think the the, the word I was missing before is intimacy. It, it, this electronic monitoring allows you to become more intimate with your hives and intimate with what your bees are doing, while actually disturbing them less. I think a lot of Brand new beekeepers enjoy intimacy with their hives. They love to fiddle with them. They like to inspect them every day. But that, the bees don't like this, you know. I think the bees, contrary to human beings' popular beliefs, you know, nature often likes it, the, the, prefers it when we bother them less. So here we have a weight graph. Here we see a sudden drop in weight. In fact, we're seeing a 10 kilo drop in weight over a two-day period. That's quite a lot. So is this robbing? I remember in the uh, West Napiculture Society uh, hive monitoring uh, conference last year, uh, Jerry Hayes was showing Monsanto's own uh, bee scales, beehive monitoring system, and he showed a similar side with a sudden drop in weight. And I think his comment was, sudden drop in weight. What happened there? Maybe a rock, maybe a rock fell off the roof. Who knows? Um, my talk was next, and uh, it was to my delight that I could sort of announce that, well, you know, anybody with, a, with, a, with an Arnie Hive monitor could probably find out why. Uh, because uh, moving to the next slide, we can see that with, with the inclusion of acoustics, 
it can actually tell us quite a lot about what happened and why there was a sudden drop in weight. What we see here is that we have a, a, a huge increase in flight noise uh, during that time, uh, which shows that the, 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 the hive is being robbed. Um, not only that, what I find interesting is obviously this huge amount of flight noise and they take all this honey, they go back the next day. And you can see as the honey sort of disappears completely, you know, the bees continue to tidy things up. But then when there's sort of pretty much nothing left, you see at the end of day two, they kind of give up. Uh, but then some come back at the beginning of day three, which I, I think is quite amusing. To, uh, obviously, ones that have forgotten there was none left. Um, uh, I, I think what's most interesting about this for me is not only does it tell us that the hive is being robbed, uh, it actually, you know, I mean, this was our hive. And we, we discovered this. We discovered the hive. You know, we, we came to this hive at the end of the week. There was a queen and about five bees around her. And they, they'd obviously, you know, been robbed. Uh, and we, we, we were left thinking to ourselves, what happened? You know, did this colony sort of suddenly demise uh, and die for some strange reason? And the bees came and took what was left of the honey, you know, which, which, which is quite common. Or, or was it the case that there was a weak colony and the fact that they got robbed is what turned them into this, you know, is, is, is what finished them off. And we can see this from the flight noise. We can see that they are, in fact, a weak colony. We can see there is flight noise. They were doing stuff, you know. And then they got robbed, at which point they turned to next to nothing. So it was the robbing that sort of finished them off. And this is another interesting thing with electronic monitoring. It's, it's what the monitors, the data the monitors are, are monitoring, uh, supplying, is, is, is kind of giving us an audit log to sort of what happens before a hive dies. Uh, and I, I go through this a little bit more uh, in the scientific, uh, you know, what, what electronic monitoring brings to, to, to scientists. But, you know, basically, it's, it, it, you know, often people come across hives, things have gone wrong, and you don't really, you can't really work out why. So, again, the acoustics being uh, uh, very valuable there. Here we have a Varroa treatment. Uh, this is, we saw a, a huge drop in uh, humidity following the application of a thymol treatment. Uh, again, why was that? Was it the case that, you know, the uh, the fumes from the stuff kind of evaporated a lot of the uh, uh, water out the air, you know? Uh, again, looking at the amount of fanning the bees were doing, we can see that a huge amount of fanning when you add these thymol treatments. And again, I think this is another indication of the intimacy that this monitoring brings. We, we all, we don't, like when we give a, a, a Varroa treatment to a hive, we often think about how affected it is. We also, we also consider what we kind of need to do to give the treatment, uh, you know, in which way it's, uh, we apply it. But we very rarely sort of consider what the bees go through following that treatment, what happens in the hive once we've gone home. Uh, and, you know, I, I think we all agree that when we, we, we expect that when we give our bees some sort of acid, whether it be oxolic acid or, or, or you know, ant juice, uh, formic acid, when we give them uh, one of the acids, we're expecting them to go through a pretty bit, bit of a hard time, you know, but we think it as a, as a sort of necessary evil uh, due to how effective it is. But me personally, I, I love time on treatments. We always use time on treatments, but I hadn't really thought about how they're... they're, they're, they're their humidity may be affected. I mean, if, if, if the humidity of the, the brood area drops below a certain amount, the eggs don't hatch. I mean, that's a scientific fact. So, so you know, uh, effect on, on, on brood is not something we normally consider when giving a time or treatment. Um, I must say we have repeated this experiment. We don't have the results, all the results yet, but we have skimmed through the results. Uh, we did it with a formic acid, with a, with a, with a time on treatment, and with a control. Uh, in that case, we used... Um, uh, uh, in that in that instance, we used Apigard, which is what we normally use, and I've got to say we did not see the same sort of disruption in uh, in humidity. Uh, this obviously was using uh, the other one. I mean, anybody experienced with uh, uh, time on treatments probably know who I'm talking about. I think we all know it does smell a lot stronger than the uh, than the Apigard. So uh, yes, interesting, interesting. We'll have to put those results up on YouTube when we when we finally get through uh, going through them. So the benefits of the beekeeper during the active season, I mean, the first thing, it allows you to watch the strength of your colonies build up. You can see who are your weak colonies. You can identify them very, very quickly and feed them if that's what you do to, to, to strengthen up your colonies. It also gives you an idea why some of your colonies build up quicker than others. You know, well, why is this the case? You know, is it the, the, the place in the apiary? You know, what, what, what is it that uh, makes some colonies build up uh, yeah, quicker than others? Um, small management, uh, obviously, you know, we're working on swarm prediction. That would be the ideal thing if you got a text message three weeks before the bees swarmed. Uh, we're working on that. 
uh, and hopefully we'll be beta testing something at the beginning of the uh, at the beginning of next season. We've experimented with various different approaches. We still prefer acoustics. That's what we've had most success with. Um, but it's not just about prediction. I mean, there's a lot to do with swarm management. Uh, knowing your bees have swarmed is 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 ideal for swarm management. Personally, I like my bees to swarm. That's why I'm so uh, passionate about swarm prediction and and swarm management using electronic monitors. For me, there is no better way to split a beehive than let the bees do it themselves in their own way, and then catch the swarm and put it in a box. I always have most success that way. That seems to be how the uh, how things uh, you know how the bees do best. So knowing they've swarmed, and not just that, uh, often the queen stops laying uh, before uh, they swarm uh, a week or so before they swarm, and you know we can we can often pick that up. Uh, the, 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 there are some that say there's a reduce in foraging, uh, reducing in foraging before they swarm again. You know, bees, as the Americans say, it's a bit like herding cats. You know, they never seem to do the same the same thing. But you know, um, looking at enough of these factors together, it does give you a. Uh, a it can be clues towards towards swarming. I think Tom Celia in his in his fantastic book, the the uh, Honeybee Democracy, said that you know you could often set your watch by when they're going to swarm just by looking at you know those first. Uh, five or six days of strong nectar flow, and he's correct. Looking at our, our data, it is the case. Uh, or, or often, uh, you know, by uh, looking at the, that that graph that we saw earlier with the swarming on it, 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 it often looks like that. So, so there is a lot we can bring to the swarm management party. The queen status, as I say, you know, uh, if we have a lane queen or if we don't, I spoke about that earlier. Watching the honey come in, you know, just purely the enjoyment of watching the honey come in, and also the uh, the alerts you get when to add or remove supers that that go hand in hand with that. And also, as I said, you know, the, the finding out what went wrong when the colony fails, it gives you a, a better idea why. Also, if you're a beginning, a beginner beekeeper, of course, your mentor can also have access to your monitors. We have a few customers who's been doing that. I think four years ago was the first time we started sending data to uh, one of our customers' mentors uh, so we could help um, uh, them with their beekeeping and work out sort of what's gone wrong when something does go wrong. In the winter mon monitoring, you can see any winter flight activity, which is sometimes interesting, particularly if there's a bit of a hot spell and the bees get tricked into thinking they should be foraging. The problem being, of course, there's nothing for them to go and eat. So if you know they've been flying around in the, uh, in the winter and you do feed your bees, it might be a good time to go and feed them afterwards because they've burnt up all the energy looking for food that never actually existed. There's also alerts when to ventilate your um, hive if it's getting a little bit too humid and also feed management, you know, when to add it or uh, go and change it. Where the data is interesting, particularly across your various apiaries, I often hear beekeepers say, oh, well, all my apiaries get the same weather conditions. Well, it's very interesting to see, you know, with multiple apiaries, you've got multiple gateways and you can compare all the weather on the same graph. You can see the maximum temperatures, how many sunshine hours each site gets, you know, the rainfall. And it's quite surprising the difference in, in particularly in temperatures. I think it's got a lot to do with the, uh, uh, I mean, I think air temperature has a lot to do with the sort of air humidity and, uh, you know, how, um, uh, whether, you know, how, um, whether the, the apiary is in a bowl, how exposed the apiary is. Um, security, obviously, theft alerts and, and hives fallen over. So in summary, it, it is a new technology. Its full application to beekeeping will evolve with use over time. As I always say, it does not remove the need for a beekeeper, but it does um, change our relationship with our bees. It allows us actually to become more intimate with our bees while handling them less. I mean, what next? I guess cheaper scales is what everybody wants. I mean, scales cost a lot to build. Uh, uh, I think we might have cracked that now. It gives the beekeeper slightly more work to do, but as a result, we can offer a much cheaper scale. I think they will be on offer in the ne in the coming months. Um, so that pretty much concludes my talk.